good evening. Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. We have been going through on Sunday nights some lessons on the family. We're going to be taking just a little break from that over the next uh, couple of Sunday nights as we approach um, the time of the year where we'll be observing the Lord's Supper together as the body of Christ next Tuesday evening. So that is by invitation to those who are baptized members of this body. And we'll be observing that next Tuesday. And so I thought we would take just a little bit of time, maybe this Sunday evening and next Sunday, to talk a little bit about um, the church and our membership in it. Uh, Because there's a lot of things that I think that are uh, really fundamental and important to this particular topic and it's um, worth spending some time probably at least once a year I would assume maybe more often than that just setting forth in an order some of the things about uh, the way the body of Christ is given to us in scripture and and we understand that uh, just like our uh, sermon this morning we were talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, some of the things that we are taught from that gospel and understand Jesus Christ said that all that the father has given to me shall come to me and they that come to me I will not in any wise cast out so he doesn't cast them out he takes them and he places them into a church right that's that's the will of Christ for each and every believer in this age who have come to know the truth of the gospel that they be baptized added to the church so we understand I hope those, uh, those of you mostly among us who are at least uh, more seasoned in your faith understand the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper and why those two ordinances are given to the church to preserve the doctrine of the faith that we preach. That we first profess faith in Christ and then we are baptized into the body as a member which grants us the privilege of being seated at his table at the Lord's Supper where we show his death till he come. All of those things are given to us in ordinances to preserve in picture form the faith we preach, which is that those who believe the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ are regenerate by the Spirit. They will participate in the resurrection of the just, and they will be seated at the Lord at his, uh, with the Lord at his table in his kingdom. And so we observe those things by faith uh, through the Spirit now. Uh, and at some point in the future, that faith will be made sight. Uh, And all of those things will be fulfilled, and those who are truly in Christ will enjoy those things that have been promised by the grace of God. Amen? So we're going to be talking a little bit about that, and uh, so we're going to find in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 uh, a few things that we want to discuss as it it relates to that, but I want to set forth just a little bit first some some backdrop, and I'm going to cover some ground very quickly, and I'm not even exactly sure how quickly I want to cover this. But I just want to read a couple of things from the book of Acts as we follow the spread of the gospel and also the proliferation of churches throughout the world. We started with one church at Jerusalem, which was the body of Christ. And just as the father uh, with his son, he blessed his son, his son's body was broken and his son's body was given. We've talked about that before, that Christ said, as my father has loved me. So have I loved you. As my Father sent me, so send I you. And so the church at Jerusalem, the first church that was organized uh, by Christ during the days of his earthly ministry, was commissioned after his resurrection and was empowered at Pentecost. That that church at Jerusalem, he blessed them. Uh, That church was broken through persecution, and they were given. And by virtue of that uh, preaching ministry, they went everywhere preaching the word. And we see that uh, believers begin to pop up throughout the world and that the apostles at Jerusalem sent men to ordain elders and all those kind of things. And they began to establish the churches of Jesus Christ, plural. And so we have those things taking place all through the book of Acts. Since that time... The doctrine of the church um, has faced many trials, uh, many challenges, been many adversaries to the truth of the doctrine of the church. Uh, And that started very early on. Uh, And even in 3 John, you're reading about uh, some men who were already corrupting the body of Christ and turning it into a, um, 
a platform for themselves, men who loved to have the preeminence themselves rather than Christ, and that they were behaving themselves very uh, disorderly in the house of God as they kind of took charge of things. And then not too long after, there were illegitimate churches who, that were started and begun under the pretense of being churches of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and they were altogether something different. Uh, they were illegitimate in the sense that they were not duly constituted, um, they were not duly authorized, not duly uh, empowered, and the gospel they preached was not the gospel of Christ. The spirit that they possessed was not the spirit of God, uh, and their father was not the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so not every body claiming to be a church of Jesus Christ is a church of Jesus Christ. But nonetheless, we trust that Christ will accomplish and fulfill what he has promised to do. He said that he will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so we believe that in every age that there have been legitimate churches of our Lord Jesus Christ, um, that he has been the head of, that he has overseen, that he has guided and directed by the power of his spirit. Uh, and through the power of his word through the preaching of the gospel and so we are not protestant we never protested didn't come out of rome uh, and so we don't identify with those churches but i do believe that our god is able to accomplish and fulfill his will uh, and that he will use whatever instruments even as odd and strange as it may seem to man God will use uh, all of the Nebuchadnezzars and Sennacheribs and the Cyruses of the world uh, to accomplish his perfect and holy will. So we just trust in God that through all of the confusion that we see, that above all of that presides an infinitely wise God who has promised that he will do all of his will uh, and that he didn't need anybody's help or counsel in figuring out how to do that. And so uh, we don't judge any other man's servant necessarily, but we are called to use discernment. And we are called to be wise. So in the book of Acts, we have those in Acts chapter number 241 that believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, very similar to the gospel we presented this morning. Those who believed, they received that word, they were baptized and were added unto them. We say, uh, we see in that verse, added unto them about 3,000 souls which means that they were keeping track. A lot of people raise the idea of is church membership uh, scriptural? And of course, we know that it is, and we're going to see a very short order that it is, of course, scriptural. If those souls were added unto them, then the church already existed. There was other members added to it on that day, uh, and that there was about 3,000 souls that were added to that congregation. Again, in Acts chapter number 4, the number of men being about 5,000 that heard the word and believed. So again, they were baptized, added to them. Throughout the book of Acts, we see the number of the disciples being multiplied over and over again, uh, increasing in number daily and those kind of things. Which brings us to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, where I want to spend a little bit of time. We see that it is uh, by the command of Christ that believers are taken and baptized into his body. We see that phrase, baptized into Christ, uh, a number of places in Scripture. And we're talking about being placed into a local church. What I want to talk about a little bit over this week and next week is... We talked this little bit, uh, a little bit this morning about the authority of Christ, right? And how that it's not often clear to many that Jesus Christ has the authority that the Father has given him. It's not clear to everyone just yet. Of course, it will be made clear. But Jesus Christ has that authority, and then he commands us to be baptized and placed into churches, and he's given those churches authority. He's put his authority there in those churches. Churches. So the question becomes this, how much authority does the church have? And I think it's a question worth asking, especially in the day and age in which we live, when the answer seems to be very little. That the church, uh, in the, I say, I speak as a man, in the eyes of men, uh, that the church doesn't seem to have very much authority. And I say that for a couple of reasons. Um, largely it is, and, and this isn't... Um, I think it's due largely just to ignorance because these things aren't taught and people don't know. But if you were to just imagine to yourself, what does it look like for me to 
um, pick up my family and move and go somewhere else and need to find another church. You know, the process by which you relocate your membership or move your membership from one church to another church is not a process that we don't have any scriptural guidance for. It's not one that we don't have any um, any instruction in God's word about what that should look like. In our world today, the thinking is that I've got the authority as a believer to separate, right, to choose to separate from one body and to go and decide to be joined to another body. And that's actually contrary to the truth of God in Scripture. And so what we want to th think about tonight is what does it mean to be a member of the body of Christ? Amen. Is that... Is that just loose terminology that we throw around? Or does it carry some spiritual significance, if not in our own mind and understanding, certainly from the position of Christ as he has given us the things of his word? What does it mean for, um, for the Lord Jesus Christ as he views us as a member of his body? And I think some of these things are... Uh, important to at least discuss and review from time to time. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, let's read a few verses beginning in verse number 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And if the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Our Father and our God, we are grateful to you this evening. For the opportunity to be gathered together as one body here in this church, and we're thankful for the opportunity you've given us to be able to open the word of truth this evening and just pray that you would continue to guide our hearts, guide our minds, guide our spirits, and in our bodies that we might glorify you unto all pleasing, that you would just bring some of these things uh, with clarity to our minds, that we could understand our duties and our responsibilities to you, and that we could love you uh, more deeply, more uh, faithfully as you've called us to, uh, that by the faith that you've given us, that we might serve you and that you might receive the honor and the glory and the praise from us that you are certainly worthy of and that you are due. Father, we just pray all these things in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So the very familiar imagery that Paul uses of a body is not uh, something that's new or shocking to any of you, but it is something to be revisited from time to time as we contemplate our place that Christ has given us in this body that he has um, put together by his spirit. So that we are baptized, as we are told in the text here, by one spirit. It is one spirit that has brought us together in Christ and baptized us upon our profession of faith into this one body, at, which is Victory Baptist Church. Right? As we know, the church is not this property. It's not this building. It is these people. So that God has separated you, who are members, out from this world, okay? He's, he's called you out of the world as children of God and separated you unto himself, and he has taken up residence within you, such that you are his temple, you are his body, and he has gifted you, right? And so we, we have a lot to do with gifts in this passage, 
but that God has gifted his children uniquely. In other words, that we are necessarily dependent, which is one of the points the apostles making in this passage. We are necessarily dependent upon one another. None of us is equipped for the Christian life on our own. None of us. There's not a person in this congregation that has all the gifts that they would need if they were to try to strike out on their own and live the Christian life. Christ didn't intend it to be that way. So he has so uniquely gifted his people that we lack certain things that other members supply. And those other members lack in areas that we have been given a supply. So by the grace of God, he's dispensed special gifts uniquely to each of his children to equip them for the work of the ministry that as one body in through dependency upon one another and, and ultimately dependency on him that we might labor in the gospel ministry together to carry out the commission that he's given us to preach the gospel to every creature beginning with of course our Jerusalem and then our Judea and then our Samaria and ultimately to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so as one body, as we labor to do that, and I like how even um, in the early churches, Paul said that, you know, if one person's teaching, this is, of course, before the completion of the New Testament canon, but nonetheless, there's some wisdom, I think, even for our own day and what Paul is saying. He's saying if one person's teaching and something's revealed by the Spirit to someone else sitting by, let the first hold his peace. And he said the reason for that is that all may learn. Why do we have the different men of the congregation get up and teach that are uh, apt to teach and willing to teach? By the way, if you're apt to teach, you ought to be willing to teach. It's a talent God has given, and it ought to be used. But we do that because all of us need to learn. It is like our God that he will reveal truth to the minds of some men in the congregation that he withholds from me. And I will hear something and think, oh, I never saw that in the word of God. I never contemplated in that fashion or what have you but paul says that's why the spirit does that so that we can all learn so that we can all benefit from the gifts that he uniquely gives each and every one so there's a lot to be said for this imagery that is used in this chapter and of course speaking to this church he says ye are the body of christ you all know our position on that that this this body of christ is a full body right we're not just a few members we have everything that we need. This is one of the things I think one of the great um, departures from the faith that we've seen in our time, and, uh, and maybe it's uh, of necessity. So I'm not saying it in, in, in an accusatory way. But when Paul sent Timothy or Titus around to ordain elders, he sent them around to ordain elders in every church, not for every church. God will and has raised up within each congregation all the pieces and parts that that congregation as a body needs to do his work. Right? And we sometimes think we need to go looking for something that he didn't give us. But that's not how God works among his people. He will raise up in the church. I was having this conversation with a gentleman at work. He's attempting to help uh, another church. Um, kind of get their finances in order and they've got some challenges and they've had some um, lack of responsibility being shown and so there was some em embezzlement and some money lost and taken there wasn't good oversight not good controls in place administratively uh, and so some large sum of money is just gone and the church only has a few thousand dollars left in the bank and, so, and they've got a school and they've got staff and now they're in a mess and this man is not a member of that church but he's been asked to come and help and I said and my counsel was well you need to function as an advisor but don't do any of the work because this church I mean they have a hundred plus members and they're having a hard time finding anyone that will fill the void and I said no that's not possible if this is a church of Jesus Christ someone in the church body should be doing that function Right? It's, it's not that we should just hire out somebody to come in and do it all for us. God will equip his church to do his work, to do his ministry. I'm thankful for our treasurers uh, and for the, the faithfulness that they've shown over the years. Uh, but in every capacity where we have a need, um, you know, the, we can understand and trust that Christ will, within the church, provide 
what is necessary. And he does that supernaturally. Right? We look at the Old Testament when he, the tabernacle needed to be built. What did God do? He gave wisdom. Right? He gave the spirit of wisdom in the specific disciplines that were necessary to accomplish the task he'd given to the church. So if we believe that Jesus Christ has given us this commission and this task and this ministry, we have to also believe that he will equip us as a body to go do what he's called us to do. Makes reasonable sense to me. And we ought to be busy trying to do that as if we were the only church left on the earth trying to do that. We ought to be uh, laboring to disciple our congregation, train our congregation to be ambassadors for Christ. We ought to see in time young men hopefully growing up with a desire in their heart to be ambassadors for Christ, to be called into ministry, whether that's as pastors or whether that's as missionaries or evangelists, whatever it is, we ought to expect God to bless in that way and that those responsibilities would continue to come to us as we are faithful in the ministry. So we're added to the body for that reason. And without going into all the detail, we understand that because there is a work that Christ will see done, he adds his, uh, his children to that body for their own welfare as well as for the completion of that ministry. And then he subsequently places them under the care and authority of shepherds that are over those flocks. If you'll turn to Hebrews chapter number 13, there are several places that we could go, but we understand that it is Christ who places the shepherd over the flock. Now you have to be careful with this one because there's a lot of layers to this that we won't have time to expound tonight. Um, but I want you to contemplate the things that are written in the Old Testament for our admonition and for our learning. The children of Israel were prone in their hearts, right? And they were inclined in their hearts to forsake their God. And what kind of kings did God send them? He sent them rulers that were um, fitting for such a people. So while it's true that pastors are often the cause of affliction that the people endure, and certainly it's true that the people are the cause of many afflictions that pastors endure, we understand that God is working through all those uh, circumstances for his own purposes. Oftentimes it is to produce humility, and repentance whether on the part of the people or the pastor my guess most likely is both that there's probably enough repenting to go around that needs to be taking place and by the way now's a good time right we're just coming off a week of preaching and we're going into a week of preaching this is a good time to get things squared away with our God and to confess to him and repent and seek his strength and help um, you know that grace to help in time of need that we seek that we might grow and learn and, and serve him more uh, faithfully. So here in Hebrews chapter number 13, we have a couple of verses talking about this. In verse number 7, Remember them which have the what? The rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. He goes on down and mentions this again uh, in verse number 17. He says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Right, and the picture is one of a shepherd who is trying to keep track of his sheep. right? And so that he's going to give this account. He's taking an accounting of where all the sheep are. Right. And it's the constant source of grief when it's like, oh, there goes that one again. Right. I don't know how many times I've had to bring that one back. There he goes again, wandering off down that same got him in trouble last time and doesn't doesn't remember. Sheep have short term memory loss. They go wandering down the path. There they go again, right? That's the kind of thing that's in view when he's talking about those that give an account for you that they might do it with joy, right? John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children, what? 
walk in truth. Oh, that is a delight. It is a delight and a joy to see the sheep over which you have been made an overseer walking in the truth, to see the fruit of God's Spirit abounding in their lives, to see that love, that joy, and that peace just brimming over their cup and filling their saucer. Amen? It is a joy to a preacher's heart when he sees the people of God walking in truth. So there is something to be said for this authority that Christ places us under. And, uh, and he does that for our prophet. He does that for our prophet. Sometimes we just have to learn to submit just because Christ said to do it. Amen. A lot of times we, we struggle because uh, what we're asked to do doesn't seem to make sense. Yeah. Which is kind of the Christian life in a nutshell. It only makes sense if you believe in the world to come and life everlasting in the resurrection. Right? It doesn't make sense if you think that this is what it's about. Uh, and so sometimes it just doesn't seem to make sense to our natural mind. I heard of a man um, who, for the first year of training, he was, I forget exactly what his, um, what his vocation was, but he had young people that would come to him wanting to train under him and to learn under him, and he, would, he was very picky, I guess, apparently, about who he would accept. But um, as the story goes, what he did for the first year of that person's training was the very first day they came to him, he made them go cut a branch off a tree and stick it in the ground, and they had to water it every day. Now, why would you make someone water a dead branch every day knowing it doesn't do anything? It's not accomplishing anything. And the idea was this, just to learn to obey. Just to do it. Just because I said. That's the only reason. <laughs> is that enough reason well it should be as the children of God because we're seeking our father's delight if it delights him to ask us to do something that is the reason Amen. and so what we're learning in relationship with our heavenly father is that when he's delighted when we do something it's like if you've ever done something you knew would please your dad um, you know I used to play high school sports I played basketball and it was always more fun when your parents are there. Because what do you do? If you finally do make a shot, or in my dad's case, what really would get his attention would be as if I got a rebound. Because uh, I wasn't well known for my rebounding. But if you did, what do you immediately do? You look for your parents. Why? Because you want to see their face. You want to see the pride on their face, the joy on their face. The fact that they're pleased with what you've just done. That's, uh, that's similar to what we're talking about. The, the fact that what God has asked us to do, right? Remember the parable Christ said he had a, man, a certain man had two sons and he came to them both and said, go work in the vineyard today. And the one said, said I go, sir. He never went. And the other son said, I'm not going to do that. But then he repented and went. And the Lord asked, which of the twain did the will of his father? The one who just said, okay, but never did anything? Or the one who was stubborn at first, but then repented and went and did what his father asked, right? So seeking the delight of our father is part of the issue. So this authority that we're placed under is for our welfare, for our profit, for our good. And we need to understand that. I do believe that God blesses churches. And I'm not just saying this because I am a pastor now. I'm, I won't always be a pastor. Right? I mean, it's a seasonal vocation. Uh, and the Lord could see fit to remove me from this vocation at any time. So during the season in which I'm in this vocation, it, it's just where I'm at. And if I'm ever out of this vocation, the truth of God doesn't change. That there is a blessing for the people of God when the man of God who is behind the pulpit preaching and pastoring and leading the congregation is honored. When he's honored. There's a blessing in that. And you will know, um, you'll know churches that do that because this is the thing. The, the writing to be obedient is given to the people who are under that rule. It's not my job to make you do stuff. But as your pastor, the, the word of God is such that I ought to be able to say, hey, I need you to do this. 
And you'd say, sure thing, Pastor. My pleasure, Pastor. All over it, Pastor. Why? Because you, you just love the pastor so much? No, because you love Christ that much. And this is his ministry. This is his work. And it ought to be such that when somebody uh, is, you know, a little sideways with the pastor and starts to run down the pastor, that other men ought to hear that and say, no, we're not doing that. It's not, not, we're not going down that path. Right? We need men who will stand fast in this regard and stand for what is good and what is right. And so that, that's what we need. We need churches who understand that. And God will bless that. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13, We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Right? That's one of the uh, less pleasant duties of the pastor is admonishing. And so if the pastor sees something uh, taking place in your life, that he knows from the word of God will ultimately not be profitable to your soul. If he says something about it, just accept that he's trying to do his, his job. Amen. That he's simply trying to be responsible to Christ for the sheep that he's placed under his care. And so that's what the heart of the pastor is, to see people do well. To see people walk in truth. To see them be blessed. Why am I preaching on parenting? Why am I preaching on families? Because I want to see God bless your family. But he won't bless disobedience and he won't bless slothfulness. He blesses diligence. He blesses kindness and love and goodness. And so when I'm preaching all of those things, it's in that context that I want you to experience the goodness of God to the fullest, right? That your joy may be full as it were. So there is this oversight, there is this authority that is given um, in the Lord. To, and it says, to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. With that being said, I kind of want to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that relate to church membership um, that we have in Scripture relating to church authority in the regards of what we do with membership, when we need to leave, or what have you. So I want you to turn to Acts 18. We're going to look, run just a couple scriptures real quick. Because whether or not we understand church membership to be a significant thing, what I'm trying to deliver to you over tonight and next week is that Christ has already deemed it to be a significant thing. Amen. So whether or not we receive it as such will not change the consequence that we experience when we lightly esteem that which Christ has highly esteemed. If Christ has highly esteemed it and we think it's immaterial, guess whose opinion carries more weight? Christ's does. And so in anticipation of the Lord's Supper, there is a certain amount of examination. We're all about to partake of that communion in Christ as one body. And Paul says when people partake of it unworthily, that there's a lot of sickness that results. And that doesn't have to just be physical. There's a lot to be said for spiritual sickness. No peace, no joy, no contentment, no gratitude, right? No forgiveness, no mercy, a lot of bitterness, a lot of strife, a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of things to be said for that. And I do, I do take... Paul at his word that he knows what he's talking about when he says that because you're partaking of this unworthily, you're weak and sickly, and some of you have even fallen asleep. I take that to mean that Christ takes this seriously. And so what Paul says is interesting because he does not give anyone reason. There is no legitimate scriptural grounds for not partaking. That doesn't protect you from Christ's judgment. There is no grounds for that. He says, let a man examine himself and so partake. The admonishment is that you will partake worthily. And to do that requires some repentance, some humility, and some obedience. 
And so I want to just think about it um, from kind of that context with those things coming up here in the next week or so for us to just contemplate for ourselves some of these truths uh, because I think there are some responsibilities we have to Christ as a church that we need to understand and take seriously. In chapter number 18, verse number 27 in the book of Acts, we find this, And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia. And this is speaking of Apollos, by the way. The brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to do what? Receive him. Who, when he was come, did what? Helped them much which had believed through grace. For, and I'll just throw the verse number 28 in because it goes along with our preaching here lately. He mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. So Apollos um, is um, shown the way of Christ more perfectly here, and then they write this letter to, to, for him to take with him when he's going to Achaia. So he has this, it's a letter of commendation. Paul talks about it. So Apollos has this letter of commendation, and he's going to Achaia so that it certifies him to the saints in Achaia that they ought to receive him into the fellowship of the brethren in Achaia. In other words, he was leaving the fellowship of the body that he was uh, joined to, and he's going to some other place. Now, we have a number of instances like this in Scripture. Paul uses uh, the book of Romans in Romans 16, 1 through 2. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.1, he's talking about ep letters of commendation and epistles of commendation. Um, in 2 Corinthians 8.23-24, through 24, whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren be inquired of, they are messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. Wherefore, show ye to them, by the way, the glory of Christ, I just like that phrase that Paul uses and thrown in there. Uh, before the churches, the proof of your love and our boasting on your behalf. And in 3 John, uh, when John is talking, he's talking about how he wrote unto the church, right, for Diotrephes to receive the brethren, and Diotrephes refused to receive the brethren, right? So we have kind of the converse of that. Um, when we read, we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. So a lot of this about writing letters back and forth is why you might have heard of or you might have experienced that among independent Baptist churches, for sure, as well as some other denominations that practice a similar thing, that if you are to leave one body of Christ to go somewhere else, that you would need a letter of commendation, a letter of membership. What's interesting in Scripture, though, is that it seems that people showed up letter in hand. That's important. Yeah. What it means is, I've already got things squared away at home. Yeah. I'm in good standing with my church family. I'm in good standing with my pastor. I'm not currently under discipline. I've got letter in hand from them commending me to, into your fellowship. And then the admonition to the other church is to receive them, right? And, and that's what John is talking about, that that receiving is becoming of the saints. It signifies that this church views the other church as legitimate. Right now, I know some Baptist churches who will not receive uh, baptism from other Baptist churches. They won't receive letters of commendation, which in essence is basically saying from that Baptist church to the other Baptist church, you're an illegitimate church. Fundamentally, what's being communicated is that you're illegitimate. You're not a real church. You're not a real church of Christ. Right? So the scriptural view is that if it's a legitimate church and they have legitimate baptism, then they write a letter of commendation. 
What we might expect is that people would come to us if they are disposed to pass from one area to another. In other words, life circumstances create the necessity for them to need to move from one congregation to another. The scriptural pattern is that you would go to the pastor of the church you are a member of first. And you would say, Pastor, here's my situation. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's the things in life I'm dealing with, and we're going to be moving, or I need to transfer, or this, or that, or yada, yada. If the church you're a member of is legitimate, then you go to your pastor, and you receive a letter of commendation, and you take that with you to the church where you're going. And you show up letter in hand and say, I come commended by the Victory Baptist Church of Kingfisher, Oklahoma. We've just moved to the area, and... Your church seems to be sound in doctrine of like faith and practice. My pastor may be giving you a call. I don't know. But you work it out from there. But the idea is that you stay in submission to the authority that Christ has placed you under. See, what happens in modern um, Christian circles is the thinking that the believer has all the authority in themselves. And so they just leave the church, and then they go and form the church where they just showed up that we're joining. And neither of those are true. That you cannot actually, scripturally speaking, there's no precedent for you separating from a church on your own authority. That there's no precedent scripturally for you just choosing to abandon fellowship of a body of Christ that you've been baptized into. That That is part of the covenant relationship you have with Christ. You're baptized into the covenant relationship of that body. And so... The church who's receiving you, first of all, they have the authority whether or not they will receive you. They're not required to receive you. I've said before, people shop for churches these days like they shop for resorts, you know? Like who has the best amenities and the best programs and the best stuff? And so then it's like you just show up and say, we'd like to book our room. It's, church isn't designed by Christ to work like that. Amen. The authority is vested in the church, not the individual when it comes to membership so that if you are to leave Victory Baptist Church let's say that you are under discipline at Victory Baptist Church and you've not made that right right so you've not you've not made things good with your church body that you have been disciplined by the church and you are under discipline and so you say well I'm just going to go somewhere else scripturally you don't have the jurisdiction to do that either what Christ commands is that you first reconcile And then as a reconciled brother, you might work out the transfer of membership to go somewhere else with the permission and authority from the sending church. But a lot of these issues have kind of gotten lost over time, so much so that um, a lot of churches don't even practice letters at all. Partly because it's gotten so messy, right? I mean, how do you know what other churches are legitimate and which churches you should receive letters from and most of that responsibility is your pastor's problem it's not your problem necessarily as a member of this church but they are very real issues uh, that have to be navigated and sorted through and figured out but this idea of uh, a letter of membership is a legitimate scriptural principle and actually even interchurch business if you ter- turn to 1 Corinthians 16 There's a few examples of this, but we can just look at um, one real quick. First Corinthians chapter number 16, verse number three. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by what? By letters. Then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. So even with interchurch business, right, the church at Corinth was going to participate in an offering for the saints of the church at Jerusalem and so they were going to send men that were approved by letters and so interchurch business was conducted in that same way that there's a valid communication from one church to another church right so it's not so much uh, just individuals choosing to act independently but there's a very real essence to the reality that is described by the word of God to you being a member of this church that you have been joined together to this body by the spirit of God 
And so that you are part of what constitutes this body. So you are an individual member, uniquely gifted by Christ, to be joined together to this body for the work of the ministry. And when it comes to uh, membership, we know that life happens. Um, sometimes families may have to move and, and all kinds of things can happen. People have showed up here. People have left here. We've experienced it quite a lot of times. But I think it's important that we understand that the authority rests with the churches and we ought not ever presumptuously just abandon fellowship. My guess is that that Christ takes a dim view of that and that that is unlikely to lead to blessedness. Spiritual or otherwise, but certainly spiritual blessedness does not come by simply abandoning your post. It's interesting when you read the book of Revelation, the seven churches there, um, at least five of them have significant problems. And none of the members there are told that they need to abandon the fellowship of the saints and go find another church. Christ doesn't tell any of them that, right? Which I think I've mentioned before, but that's a significant uh, thing for us to understand. So for us to just simply decide to bail on the, the church that we are constituted as a part of, I think is irresponsible, uh, and I think it actually is unscriptural as well. Obviously, in the modern context, I think pastors are as much the problem as the answer, because most pastors are just excited to get new members, right? So um, we've lost a couple of members since I've been pastoring here. I've never heard from another pastor at a church where those people showed up. I don't know where they went. They didn't go with a letter of commendation. And wherever they were received, I never got a call or a request for a letter. Which is the same thing as saying you're an illegitimate church, more or less, in the eyes of those brethren. Which is okay. We don't seek their approval, necessarily. It's just odd from a scriptural standpoint that that's not really the way that should have happened. And like I say, it's as much out of ignorance, I think, as anything else. But the picture would be, to reiterate, that if there's an issue, you come to your pastor and you say, here's what's going on, we're probably going to need to leave, and you would secure a letter of commendation from your sending pastor with his blessing, which he would not unreasonably withhold. I promise you, I don't know any pastors that want a church full of people that don't want to be there. That usually just makes for trouble. So it's unlikely your pastor will try to force you to stay when you're communicating, I don't want to be here. But there is a proper and right way to handle these things responsibly that honors Christ by honoring the people that he has put in place and honoring the institutions that he has instituted. And further, I think whenever we talk about church discipline, which thankfully as a church, we've not had to deal with much in our history. Um, you know, there's been a few, a few occasions where there's been those issues. Uh, but with church discipline, the, the, the scriptural template is such that if you are under discipline at one church, until you make that right, you can't just go anywhere else. Scripturally speaking, you continue to be a member of that body because you don't have the authority to separate fellowship. The authority rests with the church. And so that's where scriptural authority becomes really important, that we believe and understand that Christ has instituted the church for our profit and for our welfare. So if I am a member of a duly constituted and organized church and, and I'm uh, serving as a member there and then I come under discipline, then I don't, if I just get mad and leave, in the eyes of the Lord, as far as I can tell from the scriptures, I'm still a member of the church where I'm under discipline. Me going and just finding some other church that will accept me does not remove the discipline that I'm under at that church. The only thing that can remove that discipline is me reconciling with the church through repentance. And once I'm reconciled and publicly uh, received back into fellowship, 
then it makes sense that I might work with the pastor or whoever to move somewhere else on mutual grounds. But it's unscriptural, I believe, to think that just because I've fallen under discipline or out of favor at a particular church that I'm going to do the easy thing and just leave and just go somewhere else because I'm upset, unhappy, disappointed, not being fed, whatever all the standard answers may be. In other words, other churches, while they have equal authority with our church, other churches do not have jurisdiction over our members. And this is an issue of jurisdiction. And so I think that it's important to understand when you are a member of a church, that that church has jurisdiction over you. I appreciate my dad being a member of this church because now that I have pastored uh, and been preaching for a while, I can appreciate more uh, how difficult it is to sit under someone else's preaching. Because I'm sure there's times when uh, I'm laboring to present the truth of God, and he's probably thinking to himself, I don't really think that's, you know, worded just right, or that's probably not entirely correct. Or, so the measure of grace that he affords, but you know what my father does? He does this beautifully. He's done it for the past six years, and I don't expect it will change. He honors that authority. He's not making a stink. He's not up in arms. He's not, you know, rallying an insurrection. He's not leaving the church and, and going to find membership somewhere else. And so I, I was uh, talking to Brother McIntyre along those lines because he just had a retired pastor join his church. And he was saying similarly, he's sure that, he said it's kind of intimidating having a retired preacher in the congregation. He said he's sure there's things where they're not, you know, you're two Baptist preachers. You know, you're not going to be entirely aligned on every point of doctrine. And the truth is, the more we study individually, the less likely we are to agree, actually, which is just probably the nature of things as they are since we're men and we're fallible, that the more you study and, de and define for yourself and understand, the more opportunity there is to probably disagree. So he was saying that, you know, with that other brother, he appreciates that he submits to what their church's teaching position is on those relatively minor issues, but nonetheless. But I do say that because I don't know that this gets discussed a lot in churches. And you may not understand that, that the jurisdiction that Victory Baptist Church has over you as a member, scripturally speaking, and that that, that counts for something in the eyes of Christ. Amen. That counts for something. And so it's one thing to be a Catholic and to show up at Victory Baptist Church, I'm not sending for a letter of commendation. Because the Catholic Church is an illegitimate institution. It's not a legitimate church, and we do not, we do not acknowledge the legitimacy of their doctrine or their baptism or their leadership or their Bible or their ordinances or anything else. Or they, sacraments, they call them. Right? We don't acknowledge that any of that is legitimate. So if I send for a letter of commendation, what am I doing? I'm acknowledging the legitimacy of that institution. It's the same with, with the issues of state on an international scale, isn't it? That whenever a government formally acknowledges some other government, it's legitimizing that government. right? So there's a lot of issues that come up on an international basis as that. But it's kind of the same with churches. But if there's another legitimate church and people show up here and they say, hey, we, we like coming here and we want to be members of your church, then a couple of things are going to happen. Either uh, if, if they're coming out of some other church that they, of which they are a member, I'm going to call their pastor. I'm going to have a conversation. I'm going to see how are things, what's going on. Um, you know, are they under discipline or not? Are they in good standing? Will you send a letter of commendation for them to transfer their membership to Victory Baptist Church? Uh, and all those kind of conversations happen. And, uh, and so that's, that's for the welfare and protection of everyone. Uh, because I think what we do see a lot in our day is just um, we have church hoppers, right? And what happens with church hoppers? All the authorities vested in them. And so they just bounce in and out of. And that's why I say pastors are as much the problem. Because we, we're, uh, 
what do they call them? Enablers? Yeah. What you call people who just facilitate unhealthy behavior? So pastors, in this case, are enabling uh, very ungodly, unscriptural behavior by just they're so excited to have a new member that they just receive them right into fellowship, uh, no questions asked, you know, not doing much diligence on the back end. Uh, and so some of this is stuff I've been um, studying and learning for myself, wanting to arrive at a more concrete understanding for myself. But uh, this idea of church jurisdiction, I believe, is important and something that I think as members of Victory Baptist Church that we should understand that we are all in a covenant together. When we, when we were baptized into membership here, that we entered into that covenant with Christ and into that ministry together. And it's in that context that we rejoice with that member that is honored and we weep with that member who is suffering and we seek to um, labor for the welfare of our brother in that context of this church with its individual members. So managing membership is important, uh, something my dad has done for years and years, that um, ultimately we are responsible to Christ for judging the things within and making sure that as a body that we are honoring the Lord and just as the Hebrews were told to remove the leaven from their houses for the Passover, Paul uses that as a type of how the church should manage its affairs as it relates to membership. Again, you don't remove someone from membership when they're under discipline. You simply place them under discipline. Their membership doesn't go away. The only two ways to get out of a legitimate church are death, right? You got promoted. So you can get promoted by death, and that will... That will disannul that, that um, membership or to have a letter of commendation from your current pastor right. to transfer your membership to someone else's authority. Those are really the only two legitimate ways to dissolve your membership in, in the church that Christ has made you a part of, which puts it in, uh, I think, a, a much more serious context, but is the right context. It is the right context scripturally. And so we'll look at a few more of these things next week, um, specifically around discipline. As I said, we've fortunately not had to exercise much discipline as a church over the years. Uh, but I find that the best time to teach on something is when it's not going on. So you might remember we talked about dealing with conflict before, because the best time to talk about dealing with conflict is when you're not in conflict. And the best time, I think, to uh, train and educate uh, our congregation on the proper forms of discipline would be in a context where we're not currently dealing with a discipline issue. Uh, so we'll probably be discussing that. So tonight, just something a little more for the home folks, just kind of orienting ourselves to um, that idea of church membership, membership and the jurisdiction that Christ has placed us under. And we're all under that, by the way. I'm under that. This church could just as easily discipline me as anyone else, right? We're all, we're all under that jurisdiction of this church. And so it's important that we understand and acknowledge that. Um, I think it gives us the best opportunity to orient our minds to the will of Christ for us and to live out the faith that we have in a way that honors him to the highest degree. Amen. So with that, we'll just stand to our feet and have...